Well, I've already welcomed a few of you into the room, but let me welcome the entire uh, audience today, wherever in the world you might be. I'm Mark Frazier, and I'm a co-director of the India China Institute. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this really exciting new seminar series at ICI, Flows, Infrastructure, and Citizenship in India and China. This is part of our Cities and Citizenship Research Cluster. And we have, with all thanks to Sarah and Jane, our uh, postdoctoral fellow in Cities and Citizenship this year, a really stellar lineup of scholars to engage and discuss questions of circulations, infrastructure, and identities in urban India and China. This will, as you, many of you know, be a, a four-part series over the next two weeks, and we'll hear more about that in a moment uh, later today, and also uh, when I turn it over to Dr. Jane to introduce the series a little bit. Let me offer a brief introduction to her before I turn the program over and have her introduce today's speakers. Dr. Jane is currently a postdoctoral fellow at ICI, as I mentioned, and is working on the publication of her dissertation project, which is titled Fluvial Government Tracking Petroleum as Liquid Infrastructure in India. Her dissertation examines oil as infrastructure that mediates relations between state and society and is based on the two years that she spent conducting field work, including ethnography and interviews at oil refineries, ports, research institutes, state agencies, and a peri-urban working class neighborhood outside or near Delhi. Um, she is a 2022 PhD graduate in the Department of Anthropology from Columbia University. And she herself will be giving a talk later this spring on May 4th, and please check our announcements about uh, time and place. So with that, and with my deepest thanks to Sarinda for putting this entire series together, I now turn it over to her. Thank you, Mark, um, for very kind words. Um, good morning, everyone, or evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the opening dialogue of the seminar series, Flows Infrastructure Citizenship in India and China. I'm very excited to share this space with you all over four dialogues in the next two weeks. So I'll say a little bit about um, what this dialogue series is about. Um, basically, we're trying to explore the many ways in which flows, infrastructure, and citizenship encounter each other and what those co-arrangements mean for the evolving nature of the state. So the questions that we'll be dealing with are how do flows of people, objects, natural substances facilitate or obstruct the constructions of infrastructure and vice versa? How do these flows relate similarly with constructions of citizenship? So in other words, what is the meaning of flows to both infrastructure and citizenship and to their relationship with each other? How and when do flows of people, objects, and substances escape infrastructural regulation? And what forms of state citizen relations then arise from the state's attempts at regulating flows and infrastructures and their occasional escape from this? I'm sorry, that's a lot of questions. So this series consists of four dialogues, all of which are between a scholar of India and a scholar of China who work on linked thematics and are moderated by a third scholar. Today's dialogue lays the grounds for the overall intellectual aims um, of the series by speaking to all three conceptual and empirical aspects, flows, infrastructure, and citizenship, um, all together and how they connect. So the following three dialogues will still focus on this interface, but will highlight one of the three more. Please see web pages in the chat box for details. Now, some housekeeping before we begin. We are recording these dialogues, just to let you know. The chat function is disabled, but audiences are encouraged to write, you're encouraged to write your questions in the Q&A box. We will read them out to the speakers from them. Now to begin, I'd like to introduce the very vibrant and dynamic scholars that I have the privilege to speak with today. Townsend Middleton is an associate professor of anthropology, at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He specializes in the political cultures of South Asia, where he engages contemporary and historical concerns. His first book, The Demands of Recognition, explored anthropology's impacts on the politics of autonomy and affirmative action in India. 
He is the co-founder of the Choke Points Collective, a collaboration supported by the National Science Foundation, examining sites of constriction around the world. He is the co-editor of Darjeeling Reconsidered, Field Workers, and Lim 10 Choke Points 2020. He's currently completing a book on the afterlives of the anti-malarial canine in India. Kaming Wu is an associate professor in the Department of Cultural and Religious Studies at the University, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Trained as a cultural anthropologist, she has taken up ethnographic research to examine the cultural politics of state and society, of waste, and most recently of volunteering and urban infrastructure in contemporary China. Her first book is called Reinventing Chinese Tradition, The Cultural Politics of Late Socialism. Her second book, Living with Waste, Economies, Communities, and Spaces of Waste Collectors in China, discusses the sociocultural impacts of waste. Her academic papers have been published in many journals, such as Feminist Studies, Journal of Asian Studies, Modern China, How, The China Journal, Urban Geography, and China Perspectives. So over to you, Towns, uh, first, and then to Kamin. Hello, everyone. Uh, just bear with me for one moment while I share my screen, make sure this is all working the way we need it to. OK, can everybody see OK? Let's see here. Should be seeing a PowerPoint that reads with my title slide, Operative Paradox. Everybody see OK? OK, well, I will, I will proceed then. Uh, to begin, thank you to the New School and to the ICI for hosting this wonderful event. And a huge thanks and also congratulations to Sharanda for launching this wonderful dialogue series. And these are the kind of conversations that we, folks like us, I don't think have been having enough. And it's certainly timely. So I'm really grateful to be here to speak with you all and be in dialogue with Kaming and Saranda and all of you all from the audience. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to be speaking to issues of flows, infrastructure, and citizenship through a particular geopolitical formation, India's Siliguri Corridor, one of Asia's most notorious choke points. Known as the, known as the chicken's neck, this precarious sliver of territory funnel, funnels myriad goods and bodies between mainland India, its Northeast and beyond to Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Southeast Asia. Oil pipelines, railways, military convoys, humanitarian aid, commercial transporters, smugglers, migrants, military personnel, and everyday citizens all pass through this congested artery. The chicken's neck is equally vital and vulnerable. It pulses with territorial anxiety. Military strategists have long feared a Chinese takeover of the corridor, a lethal strike that would instantly realign the geopolitics of Asia. Particularly now, as India and China vie for regional superiority, this choke point engenders ever new strategies to secure and capitalize on its connective potentials. Paradoxically, attempts to force more and more resources through this narrow passageway only exacerbates the choking. The escalating traffic has in turn furthered fears of disruption, blockage, or worse yet, the fatal decapitation of India. The chicken's neck garners no shortage of security and commercial presences. Military bases, logistics hubs, and industries clog this cramped space. Complicating matters is the city of Siliguri. Now home to roughly a million people and counting, Siliguri's population has exploded of late as the people from the Darjeeling Hills and the Northeast have resettled to this gateway city. With so many interests converging on the choke point, the traffic is frenetic, frightening, and pregnant with possibilities. Today, I'm going to be drawing on fieldwork I conducted as part of the Choke Point Collective, a group of ethnographers who collaboratively studied choke points around the world from roughly 2015 to 2020. The truth is, I passed through the Siliguri Corridor for more than a decade before I had the gall to study it. Ethnographic engagement can confirm my suspicion that this was not only one of the most sensitive places in South Asia, it was also one of the most interesting. Like other choke points, the Siliguri Corridor is a zone of operative paradox. It's a small space with big consequences, a critical artery demanding at once protection and passage. The corridor is chock full of competing efforts to speed up passage on the one hand and to control what and who is moving through on the other. But these imperatives are often at odds. Today, I want to explore how these tensions between connection, sorry, between protection and passage, security and connectivity shape the chicken's neck and life within it. 
My hope is that this brief introduction can kick off a broader conversation about flows, infrastructure, and citizenship, both in India as well as in China. In May of 2022, I was headed to the Sincona plantations of Kalampong, where I was completing a book on the afterlives of quinine, or what some pronounce as quinine. Quinine is, is the anti-malarial drug that is harvested from the fever tree, Sincona. The normal route to the plantation was blocked, so we detoured toward the Sikkim border. There, we met a surprise. A massive roadbed blasted out of the vertiginous Himalayan terrain. Roughed in and muddy, the road plunged down to the river below and then back up into a remote stretch of eastern Sikkim, seemingly to nowhere. One had to ask, what was its purpose? Now here we need to go back a bit. In June of 2017, a phalanx of Chinese bulldozers, road construction crews, and military personnel advanced into Bhutan's desolate Doklam Plateau, touching off the largest Indo-Chinese crisis in decades. Threatened by the extension of Chinese roads, India rushed its military to confront the Chinese. The standoff quickly escalated with bulldozers and troops staring one another down throughout the summer months. The crisis, many strategists believed, had little to do with the barren plateau itself, however. Rather, it concerned what Doklam overlooked, the chicken's neck. Historically speaking, there's nothing necessarily natural about the corridor. It is in fact a product of India's partition. Hemmed in by international borders, fear has shrouded the corridor since its inception. A post, as post-colonial infrastructures rerouted up and through the newly hatched choke point, the corridor witnessed a significant military buildup. New army, air force, and border security bases ate into the limited space. Meanwhile, the once sleepy town of Siliguri swelled. The more that have gathered, the more that choked, the more choked the corridor has become. And so too, the more insecure. There was a sense that anything in any one could be passing through undetected. Militants fighting for ethnic autonomy in India's Northeast are frequently nabbed holding up and or running arms through the corridor. Nepal's Maoists were long understood to rely on the corridor. Drug traffickers funnel ganja and heroin from Burma and beyond. Human traffickers move women and children from India's Northeast. Not a week goes by when there isn't a major bust. Bombs, guns, drugs, gold, animal parts, timber, and counterfeit currency are common. Yet by all accounts, these are only a drop in the bucket of what is and could be moving through. Not surprisingly, the corridor has earned itself a reputation as a dangerous place. Residents call it a smuggler's paradise where mafias, militants, and rackets run the streets despite the conspicuous military and police presence. For those passing through, the corridor is a place to get in and get out as quickly as possible, an armpit rank with trouble. Even for those who've never set foot there, the corridor has become a stage for apocalyptic nationalist imaginings. The dystopian scenario of foreign invaders strangling the chicken's neck has been elaborated repeatedly in military exercises, terror alarms, journalistic essays, and popular fiction. Former Brigadier General Bob Lutalia offers a prescient tale in his 2011 novel, The Assassin's Mace, where China invades India via Doklam and sows chaos from the corridor. BBC correspondent Humphrey Hawksley envisages envisages a similar scenario in his 2000 novel, Dragonfire, wherein China and Pakistan team up to realize India's worst nightmare. War games, essayed, portended many times over, the script for Doklam was in many ways written well before Chinese bulldozers plowed their way south in 2017. As that crisis and a bevy of security-oriented infrastructures, including that road to nowhere I happened upon last summer, illustrate, the choke point must be protected. It so too must it be developed. At the moment those bulldozers from China were crawling into Doklam, a different set of bulldozers were at work in the corridor itself. Defacing buildings, leveling roadbeds, and causing no shortage of mayhem, they were making way for Asian Highway 2, a new superhighway funded by the Asian Development Bank. AH2 was part of Modi's Act East initiative, an incarnation of the Look East policies established in the 1990s. Providing a counter to China's Belt and Road Initiative, Act East seeks a seamless trade network linking South and Southeast Asia. The chicken snack figures prominently. With traffic East funneling up and through the choke point, the corridor poses major problems. By the same token, its location makes it an ideal logistics hub. Act East has accordingly taken a two-pronged approach. 
First, it's developing alternate land sea routes to the Northeast and onward to Myanmar, Thailand, and Southeast Asia. Second, it's working to modernize infrastructure to speed flow through the choke point itself. Indeed, AH2 marks the most ambitious attempt to stent this congested artery. But the corridor is proving difficult. The military footprint in India's, sorry, in Siliguri's swelling population has left scant space for infrastructural development. Building AH2 has required significant expropriations, demolitions, and often head-on collisions with extant infrastructure. Now, this issue surfaced acutely in 2017 and 18, when the project informed Siliguri residents that it would be shutting off the municipality's water supply for four days to reroute the city's water main. The road, it claimed, had right-of-way, not water. This touched off a political fracas that raged for months. This was only one of the many confrontations that colored AH2 construction. I interviewed many families who had had their homes and businesses destroyed. Yet even as they stared into the rubbles of their torn apart homes, even they had to concede. For India's sake, the choke point needed to be developed. What makes the chicken's neck so sensitive in my, and in my humble opinion, interesting is not simply its form, but also its movements and people. First, a note on form. At roughly 20 by 100 miles wide, the corridor is, rel is a relatively large choke point, at their center of which, as I mentioned before, sits the very dense and sprawling city of Siliguri. Movement through the choke point isn't the steady procession then of ships moving through the Panama Canal, but rather a helter-skelter array of vectors moving domestically through and internationally across the corridor. For those tasked with surveilling this space, the erratic patterning and pace can be overwhelming. Traffic proceeds in staccato-like fits, blockages, surges, and choke points within choke points. For truckers, this can be maddening. For smugglers, operative. For regulators, crippling. Amid this frenetic activity, ascertaining who belongs, who's a citizen, who's passing through, and who's holding up is virtually impossible. The demographics add to the complexity. With the corridor dividing mainland India from the Northeast, ethno-racial transitions are palpable as one moves into and out of the choke point. Bangladeshis, Nepalis, and Bhutanese migrants and traders pass through by the tens of thousands daily. On a good day, the demographic convergence lends the corridor what local author Sumana Roy calls a provincial cosmopolitanism. On worse days, it makes for a crucible of ethnic tensions and a hiding ground for untoward operators. Providing convenient cover for getting things and people through, traffic is the linchpin of the corridor's function, but also dysfunction. A cottage industry of brokers has emerged to make the vital connections. Brokers for trucks, brokers for papers, brokers for labor, brokers upon brokers. Traffic employs its own suite of operators. Syndicates, police, construction crews, drivers, and mechanics all keep it moving. The flows pose opportunities and paradoxes. Regulators know full well how efforts to secure the corridor are at odds with the economic desires to maximize flow through it. As a high-ranking police officer told me over beers one afternoon, I cannot just pull over every truck out there on the highway, he said. There'd be a line of trucks three kilometers deep. Yet he knew, just knew, that KLO militants were using the highway to supply their insurgency for a separate state of Kamtapur. Now, interestingly, securing the corridor is not, excuse me, Securing the corridor is not simply the purview of the security state. Militants and traffickers also have an interest in making the corridors safe for business. A high-ranking BSF officer I knew spoke obsessively of militants in the corridor. He was constantly on the lookout for sleeper cells, constantly asking if anyone had seen anyone suspicious. Yet yeah, when asked if he feared a terrorist attack on the corridor, the otherwise paranoid officer conceded that this wasn't a high-priority concern. Militants, he cleverly noted, depended on the smooth operation of the corridor too. Indeed, terrorism would be for bad for everyone's business. Now this is a form of protection worked out in the shadowy underworlds of militants, mafias, and syndicates, a regulation beyond the state, what Keller Easterling might refer to as extra statecraft. The more time I spent in the chicken's neck, the more I appreciated how the degree to which the corridor works and doesn't work hinges on exactly how people work it. Nearly everyone I met stood to gain by the choke point working in particular ways and not in others. 
And they each had their ways of getting through and getting by in this critically important artery of Asia. Now, I'll be happy to share some more of their stories in the conversation to follow. But in the spirit of dialogue, let me conclude by returning to that road to nowhere I happened upon last summer. As it turns out, this was a new highway constructed in the immediate aftermath of, of the Doklam crisis. The 12 meter wide NH717 would carve a new path from the doors and plains of India to Sikkim, effectively circumventing the problematic five meter wide NH10, which is both the quote unquote lifeline to Sikkim, but also exceptionally prone to landslides and traffic. The government lauded the security of the new National Highway 717, proclaiming the new road would, was of great military significance. It likewise lauded the connectivity it would bring remote Kalimpong and Sikkim, affording terrorism in, in these, quote, unexplored regions a major fillip, unquote. And there it was, etched so crudely in the mountainside, security and connectivity, protection and passage. Not so much in the chicken's neck per se, but in a broader geography of security, infrastructure, and state formation at India's margins. Roughed in and muddy, this after all wasn't a road to nowhere. It was a new road linking India, Sikkim, and onward to the Chinese border. So let me stop there at the border then and turn the floor over to Kaming for some insights from the China side. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, thanks. Um, what a wonderful talk and uh, thank you Sarandar for having me and thank you the new school IC, uh, ICI um, for having this great talk series. Um, I'm very happy to share my thoughts on the issue of flow infrastructure and citizenship in the series. So um, my talk is uh, on one of the most prominent urban infrastructure in China, uh, that is the subway. <clears throat> so I'm going to share screen, sorry. Um, okay, just give me one second. I think people can see it, right? Tangs, can you nod your head? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so um, I give you a sense of um, where I'm talking about. So this is a little bit of a dis distorted China map, but um, I will be mentioning several cities. So I want to give you a sense of where Beijing is, which is the capital city. It is in the north. Um, and then you shall see a coastal city, Sh Shanghai, in, in the eastern part of the country, and then Guangzhou, which is in the southern part of the country. So um, there, there's a long distance in between these, these three cities. Um, so um, the talk today is about the subway system in this in this few cities, um, and I'm going to talk about what the state wants the subway system to be, but I'm also going to talk about how Chinese citizens relate to this subway system and what do they do apart from riding on it. So um, perhaps not many of you know that before 2008. Uh, which is the year when the Beijing launched the Olympic Games. Um, only, I think, four cities in China at that time had subway system. And Beijing, for example, which was the capital, I mean, which is still the capital city, um, they had um, two subway lines, okay? And Guangzhou had two subway lines. But then in just about 10 years time, today in China, the country, there are a total of 236 subway lines. And these subway lines are spread over in major and medium cities uh, in the country today. And more and more are under construction. So for example, the capital city, Beijing, um, I told you there were two subway lines before 2008, but from 2010 to 2020, 13 new subway lines were added. Um, so I just want to give you a sense of what it is. So if you look at the figure 
On the right, that's how the Beijing subway system looks. And on the left, <laughs> that's actually the Guangzhou city subway. <laughs> so um, um, I want to give you a sense also of how many people are riding on it. So on an average working day, which is Monday to Friday, the average capacity of both city subway system, it's 10 million people, okay? So, um, and also because most of the subway lines were new, you know, they were built just in the last 10 years, the tunnel entrance, the long walkways, the escalators, the station platforms, train compartments, they all feature very modern and sleek design, very shiny and clean corridors, huge transit rooms, and most importantly, high-tech machines. And in that includes biometric turnstiles. So this talk won't talk about, won't touch on high-speed railroad system, but I just want to give you a sense that the high-speed railroad system is reaching out in all four directions of the country and it extends to hidden pockets of the mountain region and has covered a total distance of about 38,000 kilometers. So I wanna give you a sense that with the subway systems in the cities and the high-speed railways, railway systems, system connecting the cities um, and provinces, I would say that Chinese citizens are in a rather short period of the time from 2010 to 2020, are suddenly engaging in very frequent and rapid intercity and interprovincial travels. So um, <clears throat> I wanna come back to this map. So for instance, the journey from Beijing, which is in the North to Guangzhou in the South, used to take about 30 hours by train. That was before 2010. With the high-speed railway, it now takes about eight hours. So um, there's a popular saying that captures such extraordinary time-space compression. It goes morning dim sum in Guangzhou and dinner roast duck in Beijing. Okay. Hey, so, excuse me, coming. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you can go either way, but a couple of people in the audience were asking if you could go to full full screen presentation. But oh, if you sure, want to see yeah. the slides yourself, that's fine. Yeah, sorry. yeah sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for re reminding me. Um, but OK, I'm coming back to this slide. Um, and you see Tim Mooks, I'm quoting from here. So but transit infrastructure in China is not just about speed. It is also about control. So you know, everybody would expect that such comprehensive transit design means to maximize and speed up passage. It's massive security checkpoints in store at every station actually does the opposite. So if you have ever tried subway, riding a subway in China, it's, it's, a, rather, um, it's a rather interesting experience because in every entrance, every exit of the subway, and also the high-speed railroad system, passengers have to, line, have to join the long queue just to get through the security entrance. Everyone has to put their backpacks, their luggage, handbags, and all kinds of belonging on a conveyor belt for x-ray machine checking. Also, as really bad, security guards always wave their metal detectors wangs over us. <laughs> if we are carrying items such as kitchen knives, even Chinese wines, um, you'll be barred from riding uh, the subway. Um, Tang's just, you know, used the term connective insecurity to describe uh, the Siliguri corridor, checkpoints, paradoxical operation. I think this is really also the way in a case of subway in China, because the tension between modern speed and intense security is very intense. Um, and also, I mean, it's not just tens of thousands of people, it's 100 million citizens on a daily basis. And such tensions repeat and ripples now in medium-sized cities across the country. And, um, 
but also, so it's it's about speed, it's also about control, but it's also about high tech. So all transit payment today in China is electronic and virtual, which means passengers pop buy tickets and scan station machines and travel with the smartphones. And there's no paper ticket anymore. And people's whereabout and consumption behaviors can easily be tracked. And everybody uses uh, the 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 pay the payment app called WeChat and Alipay, and they are so dominant that it's almost impossible to live and consume without them. So in many ways, the development of subway system in China are, I would say, infrastructural testimonies of the China's dream. They have provided citizens with experiences of speed, mobility high-tech modernity, but also of virtual surveillance and omnipotent control. Um, so this is kind of the broad overview of how I see the subway system. And what I'm going to do now is to draw on my field work and some of the activist history that I gather in both the Guangzhou and Beijing subway. And that was from 2014 to 2018. And um, I wanted to share with you how, um, so the party state definitely want to convey to its people through its infrastructural wonder, what it means by modern mobility, but also surveillance control. But I also wanted to explore right, how citizens in China turn the, this infrastructure into a site to make and contest political claims. So my talk, it's a very brief introduction of some of the civic instances and maybe that can help me and help everybody to articulate the lesser known materialist qualities or potentialities of infrastructure in authoritarian China. Okay, so, um, oops, I don't know how to do this now. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, so this section concerned why riding the subway differently. So here you see this lady in pink color, and then she is wearing a um, poster called anti sexual, uh, which is which is about anti sexual harassment. Her name is uh, Zhang Lele, and she did this in twenty seventeen. Uh, this young lady, 25 year old Zhang Lei Lei, she's, she kind of transformed herself into a walking billboard uh, by wearing a poster reading no to sexual harassment as part of her daily routine in Guangzhou. And so she cycled, she walked and she rode the subway with this poster with her pink hair, uh, wearing a pink outfit and a pair of pink plastic shower slippers. But she did not do this alone. She set up a social media Weibo page and she initiated this walking with the poster campaign and riding the subway with the poster campaign and call for supporters all over China to upload pictures and share their support. So in the end, that was in 2017, 100 citizens from 23 cities across China joined the campaign, they didn't go with pain, but they wear the same poster. They, they printed the posters on their own and wear it to, uh, or just hold it um, and then take pictures of themselves in front of urban landmarks that they like. So very interestingly, many of these citizens had the poster in front of the new subway system or transit infrastructures in their own city. So for example, you see this uh, gentleman, uh, he was standing in front of the uh, high-speed railroad system in Changsha, of the station in Changsha. So because of all of this, I started to dig up the history of feminist intervention in the subway system. I find out that as early as in 2013, feminist activist stage flash theater or playback theater inside train compartments to raise public awareness on sexual harassment. And then in 2015, five feminists, uh, they, they wanted to distribute 
stickers about and say saying no to sexual harassment on the train, but then they were arrested um, um, in the evening before the International Women's Day. So, for example, you can see this picture on the right. Then, because of this feminist five were arrested, uh, many political leaders, journalists, scholars, and activists from around the world they call for their release. Then in 2016, and that, that was in 2016, a group of citizens, they crowdfunded money online to rent a billboard space to, um, to promote a message of saying no, to sec saying no to sexual harassment in Guangzhou subway system. They, um, they, crowded fun, they, crowd, they started this online fundraising campaign online and then many students contributed and then volunteers in New York City contributed the design. And in the end, anyway, they wanted to put this advertisement inside a Guangzhou subway, but then they failed. The government department rejected the application. So um, because of all of these very interesting civic actions inside the subway system, I decided to re-perform some of the actions by riding the Beijing subway and the Guangzhou subway, holding the same poster as part of my field research. And luckily, I couldn't get anyone to get to get me a picture of myself inside a subway train so but I had but I had um I had the picture outside the subway station so in that few work journey I have find a lot of things um about the subway infrastructure um so for example in, in Beijing when I was riding it uh, there were 22 subways there were 22 subway lines but then when I finished the research project, there are now 28 subway lines. And then the latest line, S1, uh, is now using MacLeaf technology. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I also wanted to share with you some of the pictures that I, I, I find when I was riding the subway. So um, there were many commercials for property sales, smartphones, iPhones, right? They were all very visible. But then, um, you know, there are also various NGO organization promoting the campaigns in the subway. So for example, in 27 alone, when I was, ri when I was riding with the billboard, um, I see um, International Fund for Animal Welfare, IFO, and a USAID. Um, their, their commercials, but then you can see also, you know, one of the most memorable billboards design that I saw that was in 2017 was the WWF for Nature um, poster, and you can see this huge salamanders in, you know, in a very colorful shapes and design with the slogan calling fight climate change and save the Chinese giant salamander. Okay, so um, I'm kind of coming to my last section. So um, after re, re kind of re redoing the feminist action in Beijing and Guangzhou subway, I went back to study the way citizens posted the uh, anti-sexual harassment poster in their own cities. And these online pictures really surprised me. First, I find out that the infrastructural backgrounds of these images demonstrate an enormous transformation of many lower tier Chinese cities outside of Beijing and Shanghai. So for example, the citizens who posted the um, uh, anti-sexual harassment poster, they often come from cities that perhaps you have never heard of, Foshan, Xi'an, Chengdu, Wuhan, Wuhan perhaps you, you know, Changsha, Xiamen. And some of these cities were considered less developed economically, um, but then the netizens picture show that they are now uniformly um, supply with shopping malls, subway station, high-speed railroad station, and a lot of nice public parks. Changsha and Xiamen cities, for example, um, launched their first subway lines in 2014 and 2018, respectively. And both cities were connected to the national high-speed railroad system in 2010. 
Uh, and also when I started to look at some of these pictures that citizen took with the with the um, with the anti-sexual harassment poster, they were expressing a sense of belonging and pride uh, with the urban infrastructural background. I wanted to come back to this picture with this lady kind of in the middle, not the pink lady, but the but the but the lady um, with this kind of huge shopping mall background. So um, this is very interesting. When I look at their pictures, then I feel like they are also kind of expressing a sense of belonging right, in their own cities uh, because you one can see that this infrastructure has really enhanced the quality and experiences of um, mobility connections and entitlements. And in a way, the kind of feminist um, advocacy on the social media platform created not only um, a resonance with kind of a, a feminist civic actions, but also a resonance with the social citizenship or entitlements to social provision as a full member of society through these pictures. So um, I think this is especially true when residents from smaller cities in China, they show that they now share the same set of infrastructural hardware services and mobility previously exclusive to residents of Beijing and Shanghai only, right? And, and this is the case of Subway in particular. In other words, I would argue that the act of taking pictures with new transit directly challenges the long established hierarchical um, sedentarianism of state socialism that have fixed people in one place and distributed entitlements that divide residents between urban and rural areas and between first tier cities and smaller cities and between regions in the past. So um, in a way, I think that um, the picture is featuring the urban landmarks and the protest posters really show that citizens experience um, the infrastructure, but also you know, the control and also the digital infrastructure in a much you know, broader kind of network. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really coming to my conclusion. So I think a lot of attention has been on China's infrastructural wonder and kind of a party state intentions of modernity and control. And I think there is much less attention on how ordinary citizens experience this urban infrastructure. Um, so does it only mean, you know, less commute time or more holiday routes? So I think my work is trying to examine an underexplored dimension of civic and volunteering actions surrounding the newly built infrastructure in contemporary China. Um, and I think my work proposed a different way to a different way of understanding the social and the political and pays attention to all the civic practices that have emerged out of this um, infrastructure. Again, I'm not trying to say that, you know, the party state um, is, it's, I mean, the party state has its own way of understanding this infrastructure, but then I think it is important to study the various ports and up reappropriations or the way that they are second use, right? I'm citing Dissertot here. So uh, I'm just gonna end the final vignette here. Again, related to Beijing subway and probably some of you know the picture, the guy in the picture on the right. His name is Chen Guangchen. He is a blind activist uh, who was then exiled to the United States that was in 2014. But then he actually sued the Beijing subway for not giving the visually blind free rise that was back in 2003. Uh, the court of Beijing eventually ruled that he won and gave all the visually impaired their right to um, free public transit without showing extra document proof. So part of my uh, few work then later on, that was in another chapter of my book manuscript now, is to study how this, um, how this lawyer is, is suing of Beijing subway and spark a decade long of civic movement related to the disabled right to the city 
uh, in um, major cities such as Beijing. Um, and the picture on the left shows that now there are artists run the volunteering initiatives that um, people would like to run with the blind, uh, with the blind co-nationals uh, in new parks for Marathon. So um, in conclusion, no matter how state planners may have intended the use of infrastructure and related practice, practices to occur, the designs seem to be always repurposed and altered by the heterogeneous practice that subverts the original intention. And I think this is the case in China in particular because urban infrastructures are not boring. They are new, high tech and spectacular. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Coming. Um, and thank you also, Towns. This is, um, uh, these are really amazing observations. I have so many thoughts. So, you know, uh, to begin with, you know, I, I immediately thought of like how it's really fascinating how both of you spoke from such different, almost um, opposite vantage points. Like, you know, if one is about territorial anxiety and state control, the other is about playful social use of, uh, you know, that drags infrastructures out of state control. Um, if, if one is about increasing flow through um, increased infrastructure, the other is about bottlenecks decreasing flow. So it kind of just goes to show how many ways in which flows, infrastructure and citizenship clash and collide and how different field sites apprehend this relationship. So first I'll respond more directly to coming because I think that's fresh in people's heads right now. Um, I really like the phrase uh, web of mobility and control that you use to describe the subway system uh, because it very often is a web where mobility and control or seamless flow and surveillance come hand in hand and are really hard to disentangle. So, you know, like the state adopts infrastructures to reel in seamless flow uh, that can be a threat to its citizenly concerns or concerns about who can access the seamless flow based on citizenship. And those infrastructures to control and monitor that seamless flow double up as means of surveillance, like you've shown. It's very similar in Indian subways as well, where, you know, before entering, there's like the conveyor belt with extra machines, there's people and, and, and these, you know, sort of choke points to use uh, Towns' phrase. So I think this phrase web and mobility of control really encapsulates the relationship between flows, infrastructure and citizenship that we're trying to unpack here. Um, on social citizenship and urban citizenship, you know, I was thinking that these are concepts that show us that national citizenship isn't enough to get all that you uh, that the state can give you and does indeed owe you uh, to be harassed less by state officials and bureaucracies, to have more amenities and privileges, social citizenship, which often is a right to urban infrastructure is crucial. And this is linked to infrastructures of mobility, of water supply, sewage, electricity, and basically access to things that flow. Now, what these activist acts show us is that they didn't just appropriate infrastructure for their cause, but that they also enacted a type of citizenship in those pictures, like you're saying, that yelled out that we too belong. So we too are at par with citizens living in Beijing or Shanghai, simply by having access to infrastructures of flow. So we see too often that a certain form of citizenship rests on infrastructures of flow, on having access to those infrastructures. Um, my question is, when you conclude that infrastructures meant to tighten state control end up being used by people in a variety of new ways that the state could not imagine, or end up living a lively and unpredictable social life, uh, can you say more about how we can link uh, that up with flows and with citizenship? Like, is it a citizenly appropriation against state control that we are emphasizing here? 
or that these infrastructures are becoming spaces of new social flows also perhaps, um, or the idea that citizens simply can't be controlled by infrastructures. Um, so is there something that this practice of using infrastructures as sites of activism can tell us? Is it something new that it can tell us about flows and about citizenships? Uh, but before you respond, I will, um, I'll, I'll respond to Towns and then I'd like both of you to jump in. Um, so I'd just like to inform audiences that the chicken's neck that Towns discussed produces so much territorial anxiety. I like that phrase, by the way, territorial anxiety. Um, that when during the large nationwide protests in 2019 and 2020 against the NRC and CAA, a uh, student activist delivered a speech suggesting, merely suggesting that the chicken's neck be blocked to bring the state to its knees to meet the demands of the protesters, he was arrested. And three years hence, he continues to be in jail under trial. I just want to put that out there. Coming back to territorial anxiety regarding the chicken's neck or regarding any strategic geospace like Kashmir, for instance, that has certain material affordances and therefore lends certain political possibilities for the state. Um, you know, it's always paradoxical. So it's interesting like I, that you bring that paradox up because I've been thinking about that paradox a lot myself. The state wants it in order to exploit it for its benefits, but at the same time, it needs to protect it, which means a decreased exploitability. So this paradox is also related to the paradox of exploitability itself, which you mentioned, Towns, that does not recognize any limits and forces more flow through this bottleneck to increase exploitability, but actually leads to a choke point defeating the very purpose. And this is because materiality isn't given enough importance. So I'm wondering what affordances does this corridor have for regional superiority? Like you mentioned its strategic importance for trade with the East and the look East uh, policy of the new government. How does facilitating flow of traffic with the East help India reach regional superiority? If you could, you know, uh, give a few examples perhaps. And what is the Indian government imagining that will be flowing through this corridor to and from the East? Conversely, what does it need to regulate? What are the fears about illegal flows? You know, like what illegalities will it ease that aren't already present? And how do citizenship related anxieties surface over here? Because there are probably as many illegal flows along this corridor as there are legal ones, right? And one would imagine that it would be easier to catch illegality over this corridor than over large spaces like, say, the border with Pakistan, uh, between Pakistan and India, because there, there are many points at which illegality happens. And here, it's just one. So, like, I'm wondering, shouldn't it be easier to secure, but you, you know, how does that kind of work? And finally, what infrastructure is the state instituting like checkpoints, surveillance cameras or more to balance out those fears uh, with ambitions of flow without constricting flow too much. Um, I'd like to say a few more things. It's interesting that people left without water for four days or people displaced from their homes, uh, people who've lost their businesses and incomes still support the project and the highway because it's for national development. You know, it's exactly what I came across in my research in Delhi along the Yamuna River. This is like in 2007, 2008, before the Commonwealth Games that Delhi hosted in 2010. Thousands of people were displaced uh, who were living along the banks of the river. You know, their homes were bulldozed, um, their agricultural lands were taken away. And they still said, you know, it's okay because it's for national development. So, you know, there was this rhetoric of sacrifice for the nation, that they must do their bit. And, and it's interesting that that rhetoric is that supporting infrastructure becomes a mark of good citizenship, you know? So finally, my question to you is similar to what I asked coming as well. What can we learn or what can we say about the interconnections between flow infrastructure and citizenship 
from the vantage point of the chicken's neck, from the vantage point of the choke point? And do you think that there's something different about it in the current moment uh, compared to before, given uh, greater citizenly concerns or given the NRC, CAA, et cetera? So yes, uh, it's open to both of you now to respond. Maybe Tangs can go first because, um, yeah, there, I think there are more questions for you, for you, for, for him. Well, I don't, I'll, I'll have a quick pass at it and then I'll hand it over to you coming. So some of this stuff I think will, will links up very nicely with your work. Uh, Sharonda, excellent questions. I mean, <clears throat> the stuff about the, the displacement and um, people conceding that this is indeed necessary for the development of, of India and this kind of thing. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth, but the term that was on my lips was sacrifice, right? I mean, this is in certain ways, a ways in which the citizen is formed, right? I mean, this is a matter of sacrificing for the nation. There's a very modernist bent to it. Um, I mean, in many ways, it's kind of, uh, you know, to borrow from Althusser, it's kind of a mode of interpolation. It's that moment of, hey, like, hey, you, we need you to step out of the way for the betterment of the nation. So I think this is a place where we can see the citizen and the state taking shape in, in dialogue in, in, with one another. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, this question of what is the Indian state imagining coming through here and why, why East, why look or now act East, um, you know, and this is comes to a broader theme that maybe we should touch on. It's the relationship between infrastructure and imperial formations. I mean, one of the things that India is extremely concerned about flowing through the choke point is natural resources. Um, the oil from the Northeast, the coal from the Northeast, now, where this gets tricky is, well, what else is coming along with, with those material resources, right? And the, and the who question is where things get really sticky. Um, Tim Oaks has a wonderful question in the Q&A asking, essentially, how do, does, th does this kind of connective insecurity allow certain people to move through in an uneven way with, as compared to other people? And the answer to that question is in many ways, yes. But the problem with the, the choke point with the Siliguri Corridor is that it is not necessarily a place that is easy to regulate. Um, and the reason for that is that it's, it's not, it'd be one thing if it was a hundred meters wide, but it's 20, 20 miles wide. So there's this, once you get into the corridor itself, it becomes this space of incredibly intense ethnic pluralism, what uh, Shimano Roy calls provincial cosmopolitanism. So understanding just at, from a very uh, ethno-racial demographic Point of view, it's very difficult to see and understand who belongs. So one of the things that I've seen is that for people trying to get through and trying to smuggle things through, illegal legal things and illegal people, it's almost a numbers game where people say there is so much passing through this and the vectors are so incredibly diverse and erratic that we can just take our chances. This does, however, allow a certain kind of targeting within the corridor itself, where a lot of the regulators, both police, customs agents that I worked with, they would have particular kinds of people in mind or particular scenarios that they were looking for. But even they would often concede that it's very, once people get into the corridor, it's very difficult to identify particular people and to have any sort of productive intervention. So one of the things you see is you see a lot more of the regulation and securitization happening on the fringes of the corridor at the border crossings. The, you know, I would sit, one of the things I did in the course of field work, but I would sit at the, uh, with customs agents at the borders. And I was always asking myself, why are you pulling over that truck and not another truck? And, you know, I think there were certain sensibilities of about who, who and what kind of vehicle they were looking for, but a lot of it was just random as well. Conversely, if you, when I went to the Bangladesh border, um, they were hardly letting anything through. And that border is starting to open up, which is raising all sorts of questions. So this who question is quite interesting because there is a lot of concern about Bangladeshi migrants coming over the border. And we've heard this boogeyman over and over and over again with the CAA and, and, and the NRC. But yet once people get into the corridor, it's anybody's guess who, who, is, who is a citizen, who is not. So that a lot of that regulation is happening on the, on the outside. So maybe I'll stop there. I think I tried to answer two and a half questions there. Coming. Sure. Um, I think my my is going to be short. Um, thank you, Sander, for asking. Yeah, for this wonderful questions. I 
I yeah, I thought about the flow. Um, I think the flow it's 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 such a it's such a it's such a um it's such a one. I mean, it's 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 such a a word that actually I might want you to explain a little bit for the talk series, but. Uh, when you ask me, I'm like, okay, so I think the parties, they build all the subway system so that people commute to work efficiently, right? I think that's the major purpose. It's, um, but then they perhaps didn't know that then citizens started to think, hey, um, what about our blind co-nationals? Co how do they, how do they, how do they commutes to work, right? Then the, the subway system then kind of spark off this new way of citizen flow, which is then the, the, no, the kind of normal citizens start to take the blind citizens to run together, not in a subway, but in new parks, right? So I, I'm just thinking how, I mean, then the state just couldn't, anticipate they couldn't exactly control the kind of flow that they wanted to plan about right and and how infrastructure plays a big role in creating a different kinds of flows um in in the country and i and i and i resonate very much with 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 um your I think you 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 put it so wonderfully that um, the term national citizenship isn't just enough to capture the kind of hierarchies and inequalities in between regions, right? In India, perhaps the the case of caste, right? In China, right? This big raw urban divides, right? And how infrastructures then again inspire us a new reordering of citizen citizenship understanding right so then for example this blind activist he was from rural shandong province and what with the with the new subway system he was so excited to ride on it and then that was the moment that he got stopped and then he was asked, hey, you have to show your Beijing disability pass. And he was like, I didn't have it. What does that mean? I thought according to the constitution, all the um, disabled could ride a subway uh, for free. So again, you know how, how this kind of un un the kind of flow that is not anticipated by the party states start to come out and how that is related to um, people's kind of civic imaginations of of re-understanding their rights and entitlements, right? And uh, and that is that is that is something that is completely out of the state parameters. <laughs> and I think this is also, especially in China, because such an it is such a seamless surveillance state right and and all this I, I i don't know this is the same in india because when you said this is the same in india i i really don't know because i remember um i remember um passing the subway with something that is metal in my in my pocket and then i just got stopped and then you know they made a big fuss out of me and then it was just it was so intense but then i i thought you know then the, the, the kind of citizens engagement with it it's it's so creative in a way too so I'm kind of also responding to Tim um, on the chat um, uh, he asked if the protest really subverts the intention of the um, of, of this kind of infrastructural space right and and the answer is no it doesn't it doesn't subvert it but it it completely derails it in a way um, because people still use that kind of grand image of of the, of, the, I mean, they still like to reappropriate that um, that infrastructural wonder, but then they create something that's very different meaning out of it. So, yeah, I, I guess I'll stop here. Yeah, I was um, in my work on oil in India. I've been using the term uh, distorted discipline. This is also in response to the last thing you said in response to Tim Oakes, 
where, you know, um, of course, we're not talking about a complete upending of the disciplinary um, intentions, but we're talking about a distortion. So, you know, that makes things difficult for the state, yeah. kind of like a cat and mouse game that the citizens yeah. in the state get engaged in. And I feel that distorted discipline, uh, the, the term that I'm sort of toying with, encapsulates both the, the discipline, but as well as the sort of um, derailment of it in batches, um, you know, and, 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 and still the discipline, the disciplinary action takes place. It's not like, the state fails entirely or has to come up with entirely new plans. It does happen, the, the disciplining, the subjectification of citizens in certain manners through infrastructural projects, but it does sort of get um, distorted a little bit here and there. Right? Can you say that again, distorted what? Distorted discipline is what discipline. I'm thinking. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting, thank you. I was wondering if I could jump in here and come back to kind of this unpacking of the idea of flow, because it strikes me as there's some something there to be thought through. I mean, <laughs> flow seems to bundle together questions of velocity and volume, right? There, that things yeah. are moving quickly and there's a lot of stuff moving through. And um, something that coming, you mentioned, you you talked about the tensions. I talked about the connect, connect, uh, the tensions between connectivity and security. I mean, you were talking about the connect, the tensions between speed and security. Um, but something you mentioned right before you you offered us that that binary there was you talked about the mention of biometrics. Um, and I think this is something that maybe, you know, it'd be worth talking about because I don't think that India quite has the, I think you used the term seamless surveillance state apparatus quite in place yet, but it's it's headed that direction. And in certain ways, I think biometrics for a lot, for both probably India and China, becomes a way in which to handle the volume and the velocity, right? Um, to allow more things and people to come through, uh, but also to, to not necessarily slow them down. Um, and then, you know, we can think about the, the analogous situations with some of the truckers I worked with, where a lot of the truckers were having GPS systems put in their trucks, which a lot of them didn't like because it didn't allow them to pick up side jobs along the way. Some of them did like it because it allowed essentially their routes to be linked up by some other third party so that they didn't get stuck in some of these truck truck yards where I would encounter them languishing for days on end trying to find their next next ride down the road. Um, but I would just coming, I'm curious to know what this looks like on the other side of the border. And I think, cause I think in certain ways, China and biometrics are probably a step ahead of, of where India is with it, but it is interesting to, fit, to think about how the biometrics and the technology aspects fit into this question of, of velocity and volume. Thank you, thanks. Um, wow, I, yeah. I mean, so for example, in, in, in the subway, they started to have this biometric machines that, that, that allows you to go through the turnstiles with a facial recognition technology. Um, I know that Guangzhou had it. Um, but I don't know if they have successfully installed it in every subway station. Now, this is interesting. This is getting super interesting with the biometric technology. And I agree with you very much that the whole idea is to manage this velocity and volume in a secured way, right? So you want to speed things up, right? You want to make sure that 10 million people, you know, pass through the subway system seamlessly you know such a big volume but with high speed but in a highly secure way right but then the COVID comes in right COVID came in and then the biometric state all of a sudden asked every citizens to have a COVID negative test before they could enter the subway <laughs> so then and so everything was then thrown into you know, in, 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 into something that's very different. So, um, yeah, somehow it's, it's, it's been a suspended biometric state. <laughs> um, it hasn't really completely 
opened up yet. But um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there are Chinese audience here and who can contribute into this discussion. Um, yeah, but then yeah, I'm I'm, I'm I want to come back to this concept of flow here. Then, um, so with the biometric uh, technology, then uh, what kind of flow does the state anticipate? Again, um, how is then how is that different from the kind of previous technology, which is you know you have the security guards waving their detector wangs in front of you and um yeah i i don't know because i think i think chinese uh surveillance technology is um there i think there are multiple there are multiple layers going on and i think they have they have all this um they have all these tools they they don't know which one to use uh perfectly perhaps yeah Um, there are some questions from the audience. You've addressed some of Tim's uh, questions, uh, both coming in, but there are there's some questions from Aditi Day, who is a PhD student at the New School. So her, she has a question for coming and she has a question for Towns. So for coming, it's uh, she asks, um, given that the subway lines were established and expanded at such a short amount of time, do you have any insights on the level of expropriation and displacement that might have had to take place in order for such a level of time space compression to be successful? And are there any ways in which such a rapid transformation is transgressed or rejected in everyday interactions, especially in smaller cities where it would have brought about major shifts in spatial experience and temporality? And her question for Towns is, I wanted to understand whether the contention around the chicken's neck has reached a high octane in recent times because of the CAA NRC era, and also because of a stronger trust towards accumulation for infrastructure development and so on. How do these two pressures interact or overlap in the contemporary moment? So that's similar to the question that I had asked in the end. I think audiences might, um, and in fact, maybe even coming would, would need to know what CA and NRC are a little bit, right? Yeah. You know what's that? Yeah. Towns, um, you want to? I'm doing the honors of, of summarizing the NRC and the CAA. So these are uh, affiliated measures. The NRC is a National Registry of Citizens, which was conducted for several years in the state of Assam in India's Northeast, um, essentially trying to ascertain who was a citizen and who was not. Um, the major boogeyman, which I alluded to earlier, was kind of the, the specter of the Muslim Bangladeshi migrant. But lots of other minorities were ensnared in the NRC and essentially had having their citizenship questions and deemed many of them deemed stateless. Um, it became a nationwide controversy that spoke very distinctly to questions of Hindu nationalism. Um, so to Aditi's question about whether the uh, the chicken's neck is, has some of these tensions have been intensified there, absolutely. Um, and many of the people that I work with and know that live in the vicinity. Um, they have lots of anxieties, and I've written about this before, lots of anxieties about belonging and being part of India. Um, and so the, the choke point becomes a place where you can see a lot of these uh, Hindu nationalist desires, but also anxieties associated with those desires on the part of, say, Gorkha peoples or others about what will happen if the NRC were to come to places like, like West Bengal, where the corridor is located. Um, so absolutely these um these tensions uh, in terms of you know who is a rightful citizen of india and what must they have to sh to sh to prove that um as is, is very acute in in and around the the siliguri corridor um you know back to the the biometrics question you know india is obviously with the whole adar system is is moving in a direction of trying to have some sort of digital confirmation of whether one belongs or not um, and this, some of the type of documents that the NRC was was demanding are, are very difficult for people who do not have 
proper paper trails on their properties, which is holds for much of North Bengal, particularly up in the Darjeeling Kalimpong Hills where I've been working. Um, a lot of the folks that, that live in Sikkim and Kalimpong and Darjeeling, um, they're linguistically Nepali, um, but they're all citizens of India, but they often have their citizenship questions. So when they come into places like Siliguri, they're, they're subject to be stopped and interrogated and this kind of thing. Um, so I, I, I think the question of um, the NRC and kind of how that accentuates the, the trouble, as it were, of, of the choke point is really a poignant question because given where it's situ it is situated and given how it is a gateway to the Northeast where you have people of all different um, ethnic groups pouring through this, this uh, corridor and also people coming down from Bangladesh, coming across the border by the tens of thousands daily from Nepal, ascertaining who, be who belongs and who doesn't is, is very difficult. And, you know, we can talk all day about Adar and, you know, the, the looming horizons of biometrics and this kind of thing, but that is to say nothing about affective citizenship, right? What it means to actually to, to buy in and, and to sacrifice for the nation. And that's where I think we need more ethnographic engagement with the infrastructure itself, which is why I'm so excited about Sharonda, your work, coming, your work. I mean, these are the these are type of questions that I don't think necessarily uh, kind of a fetishized consideration of biometrics is really going to get at. Um. My mine is going to be brief again. I um, I think China is such a big country, and and um, I mean the heterogeneity involved in um, building subways in different cities, you know, west or east regions are so. I mean, it's so intense, right? And um, I I don't think I can manage to give a simple answer to that questions but i can contribute an insight which is that many ma major major and medium-sized cities in china in the past 10 years they try to build subway system associated with mega event hosting so many of the cities try to host a mega event, sometimes international. For example, um, marathon race. A marathon race will, you know, has been has been in the last ten years been a very popular spot and mega event, uh, attracting tourists and runners from all over the world to some of the cities that you have never heard of not in Beijing, not in Shanghai, not in Guangzhou, but in much smaller cities. And this municipal government in China, they are very smart. They would um, they would then first, they would bid to be um, a host for this international sports event. Sometimes some, some of these events are, con um, are conferences, major conferences, so, but many of these events are sports events. Um, for example, ping pong, uh, badminton, then they would be the host of these international events first. Then they would budget um, associated infrastructural um, projects. And, and so this is interesting then, I feel like then the way that the Chinese government different at different levels, they do this infrastructure projects has to do with mega event hosting. And then the and then that also engages the citizens very differently, right? Instead of saying that, hey, we are building the subway tomorrow and your home is going to be relocated, right? And you have to sacrifice for it, then they kind of prepare for things rather. Um, I like I like the word affect, right? Uh, effectively, right? So then they first say we will do something like this and that will attract tourists, that would attract blah, blah, blah. And also investment, for example. And then I feel that um, in many cities, people do um, they do not necessarily say that I consent to this, but then they they kind of look forward to that kind of um, mega event hosting, and um, and also well because China is such a densely populated country, just like India, 
um, medium cities with down subway has also, also been suffering from traffic jam choke points and and so subway system has always been something that I think people feel like they will um, relieve um, traffic jams um, so I I don't know but then of course then specific level of ex ex expropriation and displacement do happen I would say that in the last in the last 10 years not before 2008 um, municipal government have been doing compensation in the right ways before that there were many more controversies especially in the rural areas and then rural villagers felt that they were displaced in an unjust way but I think um, there has been a lot of reporting on that. And then in the last 10 years, I think major government have been doing things in a more procedural, I, I would say more procedural and more just ways. Yep. But yes, there are major shifts in spatial experience and temporality. It's crazy. I, they are now, they are saying that there are now um, this phenomenon called weekend couples. That means they live in different cities, but then they get together in the weekend. So then that's how that that that's how that's how things get move on so fast, and how people can come together so fast. Yeah. There's a question from Antina von Schnitzler. Oh yeah. Um, in her 1999 article on ethnography of infrastructure, Susan Lee Starr famously called on scholars to study boring things. And yet it seems that it often requires specific and extraordinary circumstances to make infrastructure intellectually interesting and or, or politically relevant. In your two presentations, it seems the, specific, the specificity is, in Cummings' case, the sudden extension of subway infrastructure and citizens' experience of it, whereas in Townsend's presentation, it is the strategic importance of the choke point that makes it at once vital and vulnerable. I think Townsend called this uh, an operative paradox. Do your analysis of these particular cases help us identify dynamics of the relationship between flow, citizenship, and infrastructure that perhaps remain less visible in other more boring infrastructural situations? And if so, how? I mean, would you like to respond first? No, I don't. <laughs> um, and you asked a very difficult question. Antina, thank you for the question and thank you for all your work. Um, I hope you see how it has influenced all of our thinking. Um, yep. so, uh, a simple answer to your question is yes, I, I do hope at least that some of the, these engagements that we're offering today help us to see uh similar dynamics at work but in less boring instances uh or sorry in more boring instances you know one of the things that's interesting about the chicken's neck is that there's in certain ways two different kinds of strategies or pragmatics that go along with with this this space i mean i've written about this a little bit before and the one is kind of the high level geopolitics um what we might call the grand pra pragmatics of of the, of this choke point. And here we can see this articulated in the Doklam crisis, in the Act East policies of trying to push stuff through, in the heightened sense of vulnerability and vitality. But, you know, one of the things that happens when you go and you study this place ethnographically, I mean, it is boring, it's chaotic, but it's also just extremely boring. I mean, it's the, you know, sitting with customs agents in plastic chairs on the border with Nepal, just walking truck after truck grown through the border is, is just it's boring. Um, and you know, there's no other way around it. You know, I, one of the things I would also do thinking about kind of this regulation beyond the state is I work with quite a few uh, NGOs at the NJP train station, which is considered a major conduit of human trafficking. Um, and we can get into some of that, how that works. But one of the things that would that these NGO workers would do is they would walk the trains. And so I would walk the trains with them looking and then what they were doing is they were looking for families that looked out of place, um, some sort of child with a parent that didn't look appropriate. And then they would stop and they would interrogate that parent and the child to see if there was any suspicions of the child being trafficked. Um, 
But, you know, we would go for days on end walking these trains and we would not have any sort of, we would not make any sort of real interceptions of any traffic children. And then, of course, you know, I would leave for a day and they'd be like, oh, we got two the next day. And so it's, there's an aspect of kind of this humdrum reality of, of things moving through these places. And I think it's, it is always interesting to think about like, what are the, the desires that are foisted upon infrastructure, but then what are the real everyday lives that these infrastructures give rise to? Um, and this is one of the things I became very interesting is like, how do people kind of work in the shadows of, of these grand pragmatics and in a more workaday sense? And like, how do they carve out a living by interacting with infrastructures in particular ways? Thank you, thanks for going first. I, I'm still, I, I don't know how to answer this question, and Tina, uh, I, but I thank you for, write, for, for writing all these uh, wonderful articles and, and books that really yeah, influence our current thinking. Um, I, yeah, I, I feel like number one, you know, infrastructure in China is just not boring, right? I mean, Tim is here, right? Tim call it uh, spectacular and uh, actually very exciting, right? And 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 this is true. And and in a way, this is interesting. Now that I am, I, I'm 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 giving this presentation. I should have included a last um, a PowerPoint slide because um, in uh, after all this protests or or picture ticking with 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 the subway, with the poster, um, the the party state actually, well, not the party state, per perhaps the municipal government did respond. So for example, in the Beijing subway train compartments, then the, the, the subway company later on, that was in 2018, long after all this, all this protests, they started to put, um, you know the handles that you can hold on while you ride a train. They start to put on this message on the handle saying "No to sexual harassment." That is from the subway company. <laughs> but it's just really interesting how it becomes such a embodied way of riding the train, right? So you're riding the train, holding on to this handle, and then you look at it. Oh, it says "No to sexual harassment." So you're just wondering, you know, what happens and. <laughs> And but it's just, uh, this is interesting how the state communicated to its citizens, right, through its infrastructure services or its infrastructure materials. And then later on, that was in also that was in, in 2018, Shenzhen, which is another city, they started to have um, train compartments for women only, <laughs> and 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 but they never responded in a way that was uh, intended for the anti-sexual harassment campaign. So they didn't, all of a sudden they say, hey, th so these three train compartments are for women only. But then, you know, this is also interesting that men also got in because they simply could not deal with the flow. <laughs> they could not deal with the volume of passengers. So then the men and women still went in the same women for only train compartments. Um, and then, so this is, I mean, again, the way that the flow of citizenship and infrastructure and the way that they talk to each other in China, it's so, it's so interesting. And I feel like I'm still trying to figure out that way, that how, how, how to articulate that dynamics. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to tease that out. So it's nearly 11 and that means uh, we should be ending. Um, I do want to thank you both very much for this really invigorating uh, discussion. I've learned a lot from both of you. I'm thinking about a lot based on our discussion now. And for the audience, for their wonderful questions, um, thank you all very much. And we will, our next dialogue is on Friday uh, at 10.30 a.m. EST. So I invite all of whom are present today to join us on Friday as well and then the following week on Monday and Friday too. So uh, thank you all for being here and see you again on Friday. <laughs>